Hello, my name is Andrea Lorenzo Molinari, and I'm the president of the Blessed Edmund Rice School for Pastoral Ministry here in the Diocese of Venice in Florida. I would like to welcome you to this presentation on the Protoevangelium of James, and I would like to take this opportunity to begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to take this opportunity to dedicate this presentation uh, to my good friends in the Legion of Mary here in the Diocese of Venice in Florida, and in particular to my friend, close friend, Janine Marone, who has been very supportive of the school and also has really shared with me a lively Marian devotion. The Protoevangelium of James is a text that uh, everyone, every Christian should be aware of, uh, and then some, and some Christians are more aware of it than others. Uh, it has a strong tradition in the Orthodox Eastern churches, uh, less so in the Western churches, although we are aware of its content mostly through art, and we'll unpack that as we go along. Um, as I thought about this presentation, uh, I feel that this document, uh, the Protoevangelium of James, uh, is probably one of the most influential Marian traditions that the church possesses, although many people really uh, are not necessarily consciously aware of the stories that are contained in it, although they know and are influenced by it in ways that they can't even express. For example, if you ask the average Catholic, what are the names of Mary's mother and father? I mean, most Catholics will be able to rattle off to you and say that her mother's name was Anna and her father's name was Joachim. Uh, but they couldn't, for the life of them, begin to tell you where they got that information. Uh, what you find is that those names are provided to us in the Protoevangelium of James, as well as many other details. And so I think that uh, for anyone who has an interest in Mary and a lively Marian devotion, I really believe that this is a text that they should be familiar with. Now, as I thought about how I would present it, I weighed my options and I thought, well, you know, I certainly could uh, do a series of commentaries on it as if one were commentating on scripture. But I thought to myself, if most people don't know the story, that kind of is self-defeating and counter it's not going to be as productive as it could be. So as I thought about it, what I've uh, kind of come to is that I'm going to make a few preliminary remarks and then also some more scholarly remarks at the end of the presentation, but I'm going to reserve the lion's share of the presentation uh, and dedicate it to an actual telling of the story. So what my intent is with this presentation is really just to tell you a story, which by the way is in the grand Christian tradition, uh, is to share a story in that way. Uh, we cer certainly do it in every mass that we ever celebrate. Uh, it's the role of the lector to uh, basically be a storyteller. And the priest does that, or the deacon, as they read the gospel as well. So in the ideal sense, that's uh, very much a part of our tradition as Roman Catholics. Um, I will say that I do uh, apologize beforehand. I'm battling a bit of a cold. I have <clears throat> no idea how well my voice is going to hold up, or it may be a, a series of a roller coaster experience as we go through this. But <clears throat> hopefully that will uh, right itself, and uh, it won't impact the uh, presentation in too much of a negative way. So uh, with that said, let's begin with some preliminary remarks before we launch into our story. One of the first questions that people will ask with regard to the Protoevangelium of James is, when was it written? And that's an interesting question. Uh, we have early evidence that the fathers of the church in the early centuries were aware of it. In fact, the first evidence that we have from one such father is that provided to us by Justin, known as Justin Martyr. He writes several famous works, but the work in question is a work called The Dialogue with Trypho, which is an apology or defense of the faith with a Jew by the name of Trypho. It dates roughly around the year 155. And Justin writes, but when the child was born in Bethlehem, since Joseph could not find a lodging in that village, he took up his quarters in a certain cave near the village. And while they were there, Mary brought forth the Christ and placed him in a manger. And here the Magi, who came from Arabia, found him. Now the key phrase that I want you to see in this passage is that which I put in bold. He took up his quarters in a certain cave near the village. In other words, 
Justin is aware of a tradition that situates the birth of Jesus Christ in a cave. That will become more relevant as we actually present the story that is found in the Protoevangelium of James. But for now, just kind of file that away. The second piece of evidence that we come across is the great teacher Clement of Alexandria, who flourished at the end of the second century and at the very beginning of the third century. Clement was the head of what is known as the catechetical school there in Alexandria, which essentially prepared people for entrance into the church uh, and helped them become aware of Christian teaching. Uh, I have a certain affinity with Clement because in a lot of ways, our work is very, uh, very parallel. Now Clement tells us, for some say that after she, Mary, brought forth, she was found, when examined, to be a virgin. And this dates from his work Stromatis, uh, which uh, is roughly around the year 202. Now, what's interesting here that I want you to be aware of is, note that Mary, uh, this passage indicates that Mary went through an examination that verified her status as a virgin. Again, this will make a lot more sense once we get to the actual part of the story in the Protoevangelium of James where this actually occurs. But again, we have awareness of a, of a, uh, a late second, early third century father uh, that seems to be aware of elements of the story that we will find uh, in the Protoevangelium of James. Here's a third piece of evidence. Uh, it's provided to us by the great biblical scholar of the early church, the greatest arguably, uh, Origen, typically known as Origen of Alexandria, although in the latter part of his career, the part that this quote comes from, he actually relocated to Caesarea in Palestine. Now, Origen says this, but some say, basing it on tradition in the gospel according to Peter, as it is entitled, or the book of James, that the brethren of Jesus were sons of Joseph by a former wife, whom he married before Mary. Now those who say so wish to preserve the honor of Mary in virginity to the end, so that that body of hers which was appointed to minister to the word which said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, might not know intercourse with a man after that the Holy Spirit came into her and the power from on high overshadowed her. And I think it in harmony with reason that Jesus was the first fruit among men of the purity which consists in chastity and Mary among women. For it were not pious to ascribe to any other than to her the first fruit of virginity. And this passage from the commentary on Matthew, Origins commentary on Matthew, uh, dates after the year 244. So we're talking now the mid third century. Now, what we actually have in terms of concrete evidence is this particular text, Papyrus Bodmer 5. It is the earliest extant manuscript uh, that is available to us, and it dates to the latter part of the third or the very early part of the fourth century. It was in fact discovered in 1958, and it is kept as part of the Bodmer Library in Geneva, Switzerland. Now I'm gonna show you a close up of the first couple lines of, of this manuscript. I will note here that the manuscript you see on your on the right hand side of your screen is in fact the first page of this papyrus Bodmer 5. Let's see in a close up. This is the first two lines of that same page and what I've done here is transliterate the Greek into English letters uh, in, and do them in blue and red so you can see where I'm underlining, where I'm pulling this from. And this is actually the title of the, of the document. It's the Genesis of Marius or the, the beginning of Mary the Apocalypse of Yaakov, uh, in other words, the Revelation of James. And so that's the first two lines, a kind of a primitive, uh, the origins of Mary and the Apocalypse of James, uh, so to speak, as kind of an early version of the, of the uh, title. Now, so with this evidence, it seems relatively safe to date the Protoevangelium of James to the first half of the second century. In other words, the logic being that for somebody like Justin to be aware of it in Rome, uh, for somebody like Clement of Alexandria to be aware of that story in Alexandria uh, in the latter part of the second century, we have to postulate and kind of step it back a few, uh, few decades and that leads us to the first half of the second century. So if we were to guess that this book was produced say roughly 130, 140, 150, I don't think we're too far off the beaten track in that regard. All right, with that said, uh, let's 
talk a little bit, uh, before we begin our story, let's talk a little bit about the kind of literature that we're dealing with, with the Protoevangelum of James. The Protoevangelum of James is not canonical. And what I mean by that is it's not part of the canon of literature that the Roman Catholic Church uh, decided would be part of our Bible. It's not part, you're not going to find it in the Old Testament, you're not going to find it in the New Testament. So what kind of literature is this? Well, it's very important for you to be aware that the early church produced oceans of literature, much of which has not survived. I mean, most people are shocked when I tell them that there are something like 35, evidence for 35 gospels that were produced by the early church, and I would say at least 35. Now, of course, the fragments and parts and pieces that have survived of these Gospels vary greatly from, you know, Gospels like the Gospel of Thomas that have been discovered, you know, basically in complete form, uh, and other Gospels that we only know through quotations that have survived uh, in the early church fathers who may, for whatever reason, in the context of their theological writing, quoted that particular document. So uh, there's a great variety of states that these ancient Gospels have survived in. Um, but in, other, in any event, all that literature, uh, apocalypses, uh, other gospels, acts of the various apostles, uh, early Christian uh, homilies, apologies, etc., etc., this is an ocean of literature in the early church, a very um, beautiful ocean, so, so to speak, if we follow through with the metaphor. And that ocean is called the New Testament apocryphal literature. Um, by using that term apocryphal, uh, it, it's not uh, a negative, a pejorative uh, sense, but rather uh, deals with the fact that uh, its origins are hidden. Um, in many cases, some of these documents uh, of apocryphal literature uh, were were rejected by the church. They were decided they were not uh, authentic. They were, in other words, if something like this Protoevangelum of James, you know, no one thinks that it was actually written by James. It claims to be written by James. Uh, but no one actually thinks that it was. Whereas 1 Corinthians claims to be written by Paul of Tarsus, and pretty much universally, people believe that it was written by Paul of Tarsus. So uh, that's really a, a major difference in the types of documents. So we are dealing with a document from the New Testament Apocrypha. All right, with that said, let's launch into the, the telling of the story, and I promise I'm gonna put my main focus, and I'm making a, a promise here, a main focus on telling the story and not so much commentary on the story. So let's see how well I'm able to keep that promise. According to the records of the 12 tribes of Israel, there once was a very rich man named Joachim. He always doubled the gifts that he offered to the Lord and would say to himself, one gift representing my prosperity will be for all the people. The other, offered for forgiveness will be my sin offering to the Lord God. Now the great day of the Lord was approaching and the people of Israel were offering their gifts. So what I want to just pause here, my first comment, and note that the grandfather of Jesus is presented at the very onset of this story as offering offerings not only for himself, but for the whole people of Israel. Hmm, setting a precedent, so to speak, in the family. The idea of one member of this holy family offering offerings on behalf of the entire people of God. Something to think about. All right, we have a great piece of art here depicting uh, Joachim in the temple. Now, what's happening in this painting? Let's unpack that. And Rubel confronted Joachim and said, you're not allowed to offer your gifts first because you haven't produced an Israelite child. It was assumed in this society that if a person was childless, this was God's way of punishing them for some hidden sin. And so he, Joachim, continued to be very upset and did not see his wife, but banished himself to the wilderness and pitched his tent there. And Joachim fasted 40 days and 40 nights he would say to himself, I will not go back for food or drink until the Lord my God visits me. Prayer will be my food and drink. We see a mosaic here of Joachim sitting in the wilderness praying to God. <clears throat> the Palestinian wilderness. 
Now his wife, Anna, was mourning and lamenting on two counts. I lament my widowhood, because she assumed that Joachim was dead since he had not returned, and I lament my childlessness. Anna, too, became very upset. She took off her mourning clothes, washed her face, and put on her wedding dress. Then, in the middle of the afternoon, she went down to her garden to take a walk. She spied a laurel tree and sat down under it. After resting, she prayed to the Lord, O God of my ancestors, bless me and hear my prayer, just as you blessed our mother Sarah and gave her a son, Isaac. Now keep in mind, Sarah is an old woman. Remember the story back in Genesis. Sarah is an old woman well past her childbearing years, and she is blessed with a miraculous birth. Her son Isaac will become one of the patriarchs of the people of Israel. And so she's praying, uh, in fact, with regard, reminding God of God's miracles that he has done in the past. And Anna looked up toward the sky and saw a nest of sparrows in the laurel tree. And immediately Anna began to lament, saying to herself, Poor me, who gave birth to me? What sort of womb bore me? For I was born under a curse in the eyes of the people of Israel, and I've been reviled and mocked and banished from the temple of the Lord my God. Poor me, what am I like? I am not like the birds of the sky, because even the birds of the sky reproduce in your presence, O Lord. Poor me, what am I like? I am not like the domestic animals, because even the domestic animals bear young in your presence, O Lord. Poor me, what am I like? I am not like the wild animals of the earth, because even the animals of the earth reproduce in your presence, O Lord. Poor me, what am I like? I am not like these waters, because even these waters are productive in your presence, O Lord. Poor me, what am I like? I am not like this earth, because even the earth produces its crops in season and blesses you, O Lord. Suddenly, a messenger of the Lord appeared to her and said, Anna, Anna, the Lord God has heard your prayer. You will conceive and give birth, and your child will be talked about all over the world. And Anna said, As the Lord God lives, whether I give birth to a boy or a girl, I'll offer it as a gift to the Lord my God, and it will serve him its whole life. And here we see in the mosaic, Anna beside the well and the appearance of the angel. This is another mosaic depicting that same appearance. Note, if you look to the top right, you can see that mosaic that we showed a few frames earlier. That would be Joachim in the wilderness praying. It's like the sense of the connection of the two mosaics that these things are happening simultaneously. And right then, two messengers reported to her, Look, your husband Joachim is coming with his flocks. Here we see a mosaic that does exactly what I was talking about. We actually see the two appearances of angels happening to Anna on the left and Joachim on the right, and they're presented as if they were occurring simultaneously. Now we get this as we go forward in the story, because while that appearance is happening to Anna, and she's being told what's happening about the fact that she's going to have a child, we hear this in the story. You see, a messenger of the Lord had come down to Joachim and said, Joachim, Joachim, the Lord God has heard your prayer. Get down from there. Look, your wife Anna is pregnant. So we have here this beautiful fresco by Giotto where the appearance of the angel occurs as if in a dream to Joachim. <clears throat> and Joachim went down right away and summoned his shepherds with these instructions. Bring me ten lambs without spot or blemish, and the ten lambs will be for the Lord God. Also, bring me twelve tender calves, and the twelve calves will be for the priests in the council of elders. Also, one hundred goats, and the 100 goats will be for the whole people. So once again, we have that almost instinctual act of Joachim to offer offerings not only to God, but for the entire people of Israel. It's like he can't help himself. It's in his DNA. Again, another fresco by Giotto where the offerings are being made as a result of the news of the angel that is depicted as, as you can see on the right hand side. Notice the hand from heaven as the news 
are is being received and it and the hand also as if blessing the sacrifice that has been made by Joachim and so Joachim came with his flocks while Anna stood at the gate when she spotted Joachim approaching with his flocks and rushed out and threw her arms around his neck now I know that the Lord God has blessed me greatly this widow is no longer a widow and I once childless am now pregnant and Joachim rested the first day at home now this scene of Joachim meeting Anna is depicted in many different art forms down throughout the centuries and throughout the Christian world we see here a woodcut by Albert Durer uh, and we see notice the affection that is depicted at, in uh, the welcoming home of Joachim by his wife Anna in fact it's typically referred to as the embrace and we're gonna see other examples of this the master this is done by the master of the life of the Virgin and dates from the latter part of the 15th century and you can see where Joachim actually appears as it were three times it's like sequential art as we move from the left hand side all the way to the right where he meets up with his wife Anna let's take a look at some of these this is a fresco by Giotto again I can't help myself I love these uh, frescoes of Giotto and we see here notice that Anna and Joachim are depicted kissing this is very common within the uh, the depictions the artistic depictions of this particular scene and here we have mosaics now in the Greek here this is the embrace the aspasmos the embrace of the holy Joachim and Anna and I want to explain why uh, this is in fact the case because in all for all intents and purposes this event is the conception of Mary so the romantic character of this event is in some way a euphemism for the relations between Joachim and Anna and that's why it is uh, romanticized in such a fashion the Orthodox Christian churches for example the Antiochian Orthodox actually celebrate a feast day on December 9th that is called the conception of the Theotokos that's a title that was ascribed to Mary at the Council of Ephesus in 431 it literally means God bearer but most people translate it as mother of God and this is the image this very meeting of Anna and Joachim at the gates is the image that is depicted on their particular icons now I'd like to point out to you what does the Roman Catholic Church celebrate around that time either the 8th or the 9th of December well it's the the Immaculate Conception and the Immaculate Conception of course is referring not to Jesus but in fact to Mary so you can see the connections between East and West and so her pregnancy came to term and in the ninth month Anna gave birth and she said to the midwife is it a boy or a girl and the midwife said a girl and Anna said I have been greatly honored this day then the midwife put the child to bed again this is a topic the birth of Mary is a topic that is depicted by many artists uh, and it's just a beautiful beautiful rendition you can see all the women uh, surrounding uh, Mary and Anna who's always of course depicted in bed ha having just given birth when however the prescribed days were completed Anna cleansed herself of the flow of blood and she offered her breast to the infant and gave her the name Mary I love this particular mosaic I, you have to see this one with a sense of humor is that if you look in the door frame there that's Joachim Joachim has stayed clearly out of the way with this whole birthing process and there's a certain wisdom to that <laughs> he's definitely stayed out of arm's reach from Anna this is one that I really like a lot day by day the infant grew stronger when she was six months old her mother put her on the ground to see if she could stand when she walked seven steps she went to her mother's arms then her mother picked her up and said as the Lord my God lives you will never walk on this ground again until I take you into the temple of the Lord and so she turned her bedroom into a sanctuary and did not permit anything profane or unclean to pass the child's lips 
she sent for the undefiled daughters of the Hebrews, and they kept her amused. Now the child had her first birthday, and Joachim gave a great banquet and invited the high priests, priests, scholars, council of elders, and all the people of Israel. Joachim presented the child to the priests, and they blessed her. God of our fathers, bless this child and give her a name which will be on the lips of future generations forever. And everyone said, so be it. Amen. He presented her to the high priests and they blessed her. Most high God, look on this child and bless her with the ultimate blessing, one which cannot be surpassed. And here we have a beautiful mosaic of the priests blessing the infant Mary who's in the arms of her father Joachim on the left. Her mother then took her up to the sanctuary, the bedroom, and gave her rest to the child. And Anna composed a song for the Lord God. I will sing a sacred song to the Lord my God because he has visited me and taken away the disgrace attributed to me by my enemies. The Lord my God has given me the fruit of his righteousness, single yet manifold before him. Who will announce to the sons of Rubel that Anna, Anna has a child at the breast? Listen, listen, you 12 tribes of Israel. Anna has a child at her breast. Anna made her rest in the bedroom, the sanctuary, and, went, and then went out and began serving her guests. When the banquet was over, they left in good spirits and praised the God of Israel. Many months passed, but when the child reached two years of age, Joachim said, let's take her up to the temple of the Lord so that we can keep the promise we made or else the Lord will be angry with us and our gift will be unacceptable. And Anna said, let's wait until she is three so she won't miss her father or mother. And Joachim agreed, okay, let's wait. When the child turned three years of age, Joachim said, let's send for the undefiled Hebrew daughters. Let them each take a lamp and light it so that the child won't turn back and have her heart captivated by things outside the Lord's temple. And this is what they did until the time that they ascended to the Lord's temple. And so we have here the presentation of Mary in the temple, the feast of which is celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church, November 21st. I'd like to point out here in these depictions, you're going to see precisely this, the young women that are right in the middle of this mosaic. Note that they all are carrying candles. And the last one, of course, reaching back and taking the hand of the Blessed Mother as a, just a little girl. She's depicted half the size of the others. Again, the same figure, Mary, appears being blessed by the high priest on the right-hand side of the mosaic. It's a very beautiful one. And this particular, um, this particular icon is called Ta Esodia the Theotoku. And basically what it translates to is the entrance of the Theotokos into the temple. And again, in this one just as well, you see the same uh, construction of the icon. And if you pay attention here, take a look at the right top corner. You see Mary seated as if on some kind of a couch and an angel appearing with something in its hands. Just file that away. That will become important later in the story. These are other icons depicting that same thing, the entrance of Mary into the temple. And again, you see the repetition of the virgins with their lights uh, following in this procession where Mary is then presented to the high priest. And again, particularly on the icon on the right, you see Mary seated as if on like a little couch and there an angel appearing with something in its hands. Stand by. This is a, a rendition by uh, Giotto. This one I like quite a lot. Um, I really appreciate this one. Now, what's interesting about it is Mary is the woman in the middle. And in this particular rendition, she's presented more as a teenager, as if she's you know, maybe a few months away from where she will be betrothed to Joseph. Uh, and if you look, uh, she is eagerly rushing up the stairs 
to meet the high priest who has a kind of a papal mitre, so to speak, I'm sure no accident, uh, and he's reaching down to, to welcome her. You have Anna and Joachim in the, at the center left of the, of the painting with halos pointing up. Uh, uh, you can see um, the hand of Joachim is painting, pointing up towards the high priest. And what I like about this, you think to yourself, you know, a young girl, Mary, she's going to be in the temple. I mean, you know, how, how much of a life is that going to be for her in this story? But in this particular painting, what's beautiful is if you notice in the top right par part of the painting, you see young girls rushing out the door. These are other temple virgins that are rushing out the door to meet Mary. So you get the feeling that not only is she going to be welcomed by the high priest, but she's going to have lots of friends who will spend her days with. And uh, that's kind of a comforting thought and a beautiful thought. Again, we have um, a, a rendition here of the presentation. And you see, again, a more faithful rendition in the fact that Mary is depicted in the center as a very little child, a three-year-old. And what's cute here is that she has her arms folded with a certain level of determination as she looks back at her mother, uh, as if she's kind of, you know, questioning, uh, you know, if if she should do what she's been being ordered to do. This is one by Titian, um, and I really like this one. I mean, this is a massive painting. You can see that down below there, the, these are actually doorways uh, that are part of this painting, but it's a very powerful uh, depiction of this event, of the, of the presentation of Mary in the temple. And again, the priest welcomed her, kissed her, and blessed her. The Lord God has exalted your name among all generations. In you, the Lord will disclose his redemption to the people of Israel during the last days. And he sat her down on the third step of the altar, and the Lord showered favor on her. And she danced, and the whole house of Israel loved her. Again, here in this mosaic, look at the top right. You see a seated Mary and an angel presenting something to her. All right, we've held this long enough. And Mary lived in the temple of the Lord. She was fed there like a dove, receiving her food from the hand of a heavenly messenger. And of course, this is uh, not an unprecedented event. We have this same kind of idea of uh, a heavenly messenger providing bread uh, to a holy figure in the story of Elijah uh, when he's in the wilderness on his way to Mount Horeb. And I believe that's in 1 Kings, if my memory is serving me correctly. Um, and so you see that, you know, not only is she living in the holiest sanctuary of God, but that God himself is actually providing her daily sustenance. Uh, a, a beautiful uh, image and a, certainly an underlining of Mary's holiness as she is depicted in the story. When she turned 12, however, there was a meeting of the priests. Look, they said, Mary has turned 12 in the temple of the Lord. What should we do with her so that she won't pollute the sanctuary of the Lord our God? Of course, they're making reference to the onset of her monthly cycle. And they said to the high priest, you stand at the altar of the Lord, enter and pray about her, and we'll do whatever the Lord God discloses to you. And so the high priest took the vestment with the 12 bells, entered the Holy of Holies and began to pray about her. And suddenly, a messenger of the Lord appeared, Zechariah, Zechariah, go out and assemble the widowers of the people and have them each bring a staff. She will become the wife of the one to whom the Lord God shows a sign. And so heralds covered the surrounding territory of Judea. The trumpet of the Lord sounded and all the widowers came running. And Joseph, too, threw down his carpenter's axe and left for the meeting. When they had all gathered, they went to the high priest with their staffs. After the high priest had collected everyone's staff, he entered the temple and began to pray. When he had finished his prayer, he took the staffs and went out and began to give them back to each man. But there was no sign on any of them. Joseph got the last staff. Suddenly a dove came out of this staff and perched on Joseph's head. Joseph, Joseph, the high priest said, you've been chosen by lot to take the virgin of the Lord into your care and protection. But Joseph objected. I already have sons and I'm an old man. 
She's only a young woman. I'm afraid I'll become the butt of jokes among the people of Israel. And the high priest responded, Joseph, fear the Lord your God and remember what God did to Dathan, Abiron, and Cori. The earth was split open and they were all swallowed up because of their objection. So now, Joseph, you ought to take heed so that the same thing won't happen to your family. We see here in this fresco by Giotto, notice the depiction of the dove settling on and also the flowering staff of Joseph. Here in our own diocese, we have uh, down at Bishop Rowe High School in Fort Myers, we actually have a statue of Joseph that has a flowering staff. I, I rather noticed that as I was walking in one day uh, to one of the conferences that's held there from time to time. Again, we see here a mosaic, and note that the staff uh, is being given to Joseph, and it's already budding, flowering. And he's awarded the young Mary. In this particular mosaic, she's uh, depicted as very small, almost as if she was back when she was actually presented into the temple. But we know from the story that she's 12 years old at the time she's given to Joseph. And so out of fear, Joseph took her into his care and protection. And here, this is again another f uh, fresco of Giotto, there's a whole sequence, as you have already seen in the last several slides, uh, but I like this one a lot because this is one where she's actually being led in procession, in a marriage procession to the house of Joseph, and I find that to be uh, particularly romantic and beautiful. And he said to her, Joseph, Mary, I've gotten you from the temple of the Lord, but now I'm leaving you at home. I'm going away to build houses, but I'll come back to you. The Lord will protect you. Now, of course, it's very important for us to note here that Joseph, of course, being a carpenter, we see him with one of his sons. And if you look in this mosaic, we have a basket on the back of his son, and it's filled with tools. So he's going off to build houses. Now, from a literary point of view, why this is important is that the author wants to emphasize that Joseph isn't even around at the time of Mary becoming pregnant, so that any male presence in the house is is eliminated, is removed from the equation to kind of underline the amazing character of her pregnancy and subsequent uh, birth of her son, Jesus. Meanwhile, there was a council of the priests who agreed, let's make a veil for the temple of the Lord. And the high priest said, summon the true virgins from the tribe of David. And so the temple assistants left and searched everywhere and found seven, of course, seven being the perfect number, and the high priest then remembered the girl Mary, that she, too, was from the tribe of David and was pure in God's eyes. And so the temple assistants went out and got her. And they took the maidens into the temple of the Lord. And the high priest said, cast lots for me to decide who will spin which threads for the veil, the gold, the white, the linen, the silk, the violet, the scarlet, and the true purple. And the true purple and scarlet threads fell to Mary and she took them and returned home. Now it was at this time that Zechariah became mute and Samuel took his place until Zechariah regained his speech. Meanwhile, Mary had taken up the scarlet thread and was spinning it. Now just a note here, note the colors that are given to Mary that fall to her by lot. First of all, the scarlet, which is the symbol, uh, symbolic color of blood, and then the true purple, which of course is, is evocative of imagery that is royal in character. So we have the idea of blood and royalty associated uh, with Mary. Again, foreshadowing what will of course occur with regard to her son. Note also that Mary ironically is involved in making the temple's veil, that very veil that will be torn in two, the Gospel of Mark tells us, uh, at the very death of her son, Jesus. Interesting. <clears throat> and here we have a mosaic where Mary is actually given the skein of uh, wool that she will be spinning for the temple veil as are the other virgins of uh, the house of Israel that are, are behind her. And she took her water jar and she went out to fill it with water. And suddenly there was a voice saying to her, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And Mary began looking around both right and left and to see where the voice was coming from. She became terrified and went home. Note here we have uh, kind of a twofold uh, 
annunciation as the story unfolds here in the Protoevangelium of James. Notice here in this particular mosaic, or not mosaic, but um, icon, uh, I rather like this one a lot. We have the archangel Gabriel that is appearing to Mary, and notice that she's by the well, and we have the pitcher of water uh, that is referred to in the story. All of that is depicted, of course, in this particular icon. Now, after putting the water jar down and taking up the purple thread, notice the symbolism, she's got the thread symbolic of royalty, she sat down in her chair and began to spin. A heavenly messenger suddenly stood before her. Don't be afraid, Mary. You see, you found favor in the sight of the Lord of all. You will conceive by means of his word. But as she listened, Mary was doubtful and said, If I actually conceive by the Lord, the living God, will I also give birth the way that women usually do? And the messenger of the Lord replied, No, Mary, because the power of the Lord God will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, Son of the Most High, and you will name him Jesus. The name means he will save his people from their sins. And Mary said, Here I am, the Lord's slave before him. I pray that all you told me comes true. And I rather like this icon. Notice that in her hand, in Mary's hand, what we find here? we find the thread. In this case, the scarlet thread, not necessarily accurate to what we just saw in the story itself, but uh, again, she's depicted as, as spinning uh, when the angel comes to her. Now, what's the significance of the spinning? Uh, this is kind of a, an image in the ancient world. The ideal woman is a woman who is, spends her time taking care of her family. Um, and in the, the spinning is typically associated with her creating the cloth that she will then turn around and make the clothes that will clothe her family. So that all of her time is taken up uh, concerning herself with the well-being and the care and the equipment of her own family. And that is like the ideal uh, depiction of what, you know, the best kind of woman uh, in the ancient world. And so Mary is depicted as the best kind of woman. Let's go on with our story. Mary rejoiced and left to visit her relative Elizabeth. She knocked at the door. Elizabeth heard her, tossed aside the scarlet thread. Now notice, Elizabeth has scarlet thread that she's weaving with. Now, what's the name of her son? John the Baptist. And what happened to him? Oh yes, martyrdom. She ran to the door and opened it for her. And she blessed her and said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should visit me? You see, the baby inside me has jumped for joy and blessed you. But Mary forgot the mysteries which the heavenly messenger Gabriel had spoken. And she looked up to the sky and said, Who am I, Lord, that every generation on earth will congratulate me? Now this is a rather interesting wrinkle in the story in the Protoevangelium of James is that it depicts Mary as having forgotten that she is been told that she's going to conceive by the Holy Spirit and, and bear a child. And so it's like the pregnancy comes to her from God, but she has been, uh, has lost the memory of how that occurs. And so it's, it's almost as if the faith that is required of Mary, because she knows that she hasn't had sex with any man, as will you know, be emphasized as we go forward in the story, and yet she finds herself pregnant. And so her confusion and her struggle with that, and yet her having to move forward in, in a, uh, a manner that is faithful and true to God. And she has to do that all with the memory of that supernatural revelation that was given to her by Gabriel having been wiped away. A rather interesting and intriguing wrinkle to this particular variant of the story. Now she spent three months with Elizabeth. Day by day, her womb kept swelling. And so Mary became frightened. Remember, she doesn't understand what's going on. She returned home and hid from the people of Israel. She was just 16 years old when these mysterious things happened to her. She was in her sixth month when one day Joseph came home from his building projects, entered his house, and found her pregnant. 
He struck himself on the face and threw himself to the ground on sackcloth and began to cry bitterly, What sort of face should I present to the Lord God? What prayer can I say on her behalf, since I received her as a virgin from the temple of the Lord God and didn't protect her? Who has set this trap for me? Who has done this evil deed in my house? Who has lured this virgin away from me and violated her? The story of Adam has been repeated in my case, hasn't it? For just as Adam was praying when the serpent came and found Eve alone, deceived her and corrupted her, so the same thing is, has happened to me. Now it's a, <clears throat> rather worth us pausing here for a moment. We see in this story a certain literary device where Joseph recalls to the memory of the reader the story of Adam and Eve, okay? The, the first man and the first woman whose sin caused the fall of all humanity, okay? And he's comparing Mary to Eve and saying, you know, just as Eve sinned, so my, my spouse, my, Mar my Mary has sinned, just like the first Eve. Now, there's a certain irony, in the, and the author is winking at the, uh, at the audience to some degree, because remember, there's a backstory here. As early as the mid-50s of the first century, in the letter of Paul to the Romans, I believe it's in chapter 5, Paul compares Jesus to the Adam story and talks about the first Adam and then this last Adam, this, this new Adam that he is you know, comparing the first Adam to Jesus. And just as that first Adam's sin damned all of humanity, so the obedience of this new Adam has caused the opportunity for salvation that is much more, much greater than any loss that was uh, set in motion by that first Adam. Now, Paul doesn't talk about Eve, but in the second century, we read in the writings of the church father Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, where he talks about the idea of Mary as the new Eve and talks about just as the first Eve's disobedience led to the downfall of humanity, so the obedience of Mary, the new Eve, has set about the possibility of salvation for us all. And so that idea, I mention that because this idea of Mary as kind of the new Eve is in the air, so to speak, in the second century. And we find it not only in the writings of Irenaeus, or say roughly around 180, uh, but we also see it here in the Protoevangelium of James, this idea. And he's comparing, of course, and, of, and you know, the reader, of course, knows that far from being a duplicate of the first Eve, Mary is, in fact, righting the wrongs of the first Eve by becoming the new Eve. And so I just couldn't resist but to point that out uh, for us as we move through the story. <clears throat> So Joseph got up from the sackcloth and summoned Mary and said to her, God has taken a special interest in you. How could you have done this? Have you forgotten the Lord your God? Why have you brought shame on yourself, you who were raised in the Holy of Holies and fed by a heavenly messenger? But she began to cry bitter tears. I'm innocent. I haven't had sex with any man. And Joseph said to her, then where did this child you're carrying come from? And she replied, As the Lord my God lives, I, I don't know where it came from. I love this piece of art. It's called Our Lady of Sorrows. And I know it's associated, of course, with, with uh, Mary as she sees the death of her son Jesus on the cross. But I couldn't resist associating it with this particular uh, story where she's crying. It must have been an extremely touching scene. I, I just think that this art really... Uh, depicts that beautifully. And Joseph became very frightened and no longer spoke with her as he pondered what he was going to do with her. And Joseph said to himself, if I try to cover up her sin, I'll end up going against the law of the Lord. And if I disclose her condition to the people of Israel, I'm afraid that the child inside her might be heaven sent and I'm, I'll end up handing innocent blood over to a death sentence. So what should I do with her? I know. I'll divorce her quietly. But when night came, a messenger of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream and said, 
don't be afraid of this girl because the child in her is the Holy Spirit's doing. She will have a son and you will name him Jesus. The name means he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph got up from his sleep and praised the God of Israel who had given him this favor. And so he began to protect the girl. Then Annas the scholar came to him and said, Joseph, why haven't you attended our assembly? And he replied to him, because I was worn out from the trip and rested my first day home. Then Annas turned and saw Mary was pregnant. He left in a hurry for the high priest and said to him, you remember Joseph, don't you? The man you yourself vouched for? Well, he has committed a serious offense. And the high priest asked, in what way? Joseph has violated the virgin he received from the temple of the Lord. He replied, he had his way with her and hasn't disclosed his action to the people of Israel. And the high priest asked him, has Joseph really done this? And he replied, send temple assistance and you'll find the virgin pregnant. And so the temple assistants went and found her just as Annas has reported. And then they brought her along with Joseph to the court. Mary. Why have you done this? The high priest asked her. Why have you humiliated yourself? Have you forgotten the Lord your God, you who are raised in the Holy of Holies and, and fed by heavenly messengers, you of all people who heard their hymns and danced for them? Why have you done this? Then she wept bitterly. As the Lord God lives, I stand innocent before him. Believe me, I've not had sex with any man. And the high priest said, Joseph, why have you done this? And Joseph says, as the Lord lives, I'm innocent where she is concerned. And the high priest said, don't perjure yourself, but tell the truth. You've had your way with her and haven't disclosed this action to the people of Israel. And you haven't humbled yourself under God's mighty hand so that your offspring might be blessed. But Joseph was silent. Then the high priest said, Return the virgin you receive from the temple of the Lord. And Joseph burst into tears. And the high priest said, I'm going to give you the Lord drink test, and it will disclose your sin clearly to both of you. This is making reference, by the way, there is a drink test that is described in the book of Numbers, chapter 5. Uh, in fact, I was unaware of this myself. This was actually brought to my attention by a friend of mine, Mary McGinnis. And she noted that in chapter 5 of the book of Numbers, that if a, a man suspects that his woman uh, has been unfaithful to him, that he can bring her before the high priest and, and he will administer a drink test where he actually takes the dust out of the sanctuary, puts it in water, and then makes her repeat a curse on herself if she has, in fact, uh, been unfaithful, and that the water will cause her great pain. It's actually a pretty graphic text that, to describe what it would do if she's, in fact, guilty but it will have no impact on her if she's not guilty. Okay, with that said, and the high priest took the water and made Joseph drink it and sent him into the wilderness, but he returned unharmed. Hmm. And he made the girl drink it too and sent her into the wilderness. And she also came back unharmed. And everybody was surprised because their sin had not been revealed. So the high priest said, if the Lord... God has not exposed your sin, then neither do I condemn you. And he dismissed them. Joseph took Mary and returned home celebrating and praising the God of Israel. Now an order came from the Emperor Augustus that everybody in Bethlehem of Judea be enrolled in the census. And Joseph wondered, I'll enroll my sons, but what am I going to do with this girl? How will I enroll her? As my wife? <laughs> I'm ashamed to do that. As my daughter, the people of Israel know she's not my daughter. How is this to be decided? It depends on the Lord. And so he saddled his donkey and had her get on it. And his son led it, and Samuel brought up the rear. And as they neared the three-mile marker, Joseph turned around and saw that she was sulking. And he said to himself, perhaps the baby she's carrying is causing her discomfort. Joseph turned around again and saw that she was laughing and said to her, Mary, what's going on with you? One minute I see you laughing and the next minute you're sulking. And she replied, Joseph, it's because I imagine two peoples in front of me, 
one weeping and mourning and the other celebrating and jumping for joy. Halfway through the trip, Mary said to him, Joseph, help me down from the donkey. The child inside me is about to be born. And he helped her down and said to her, where will I take you to give you some privacy since this place is out in the open? He found a cave nearby and took her inside. He stationed his sons to guard her and went to look for a Hebrew midwife in the country around Bethlehem. Now I, Joseph, was walking along and yet not going anywhere. I looked up at the vault of the sky and I saw it standing still and then at the clouds and saw them paused in amazement and the birds of the sky suspended in midair. And I looked on the earth and I saw a bowl lying there and workers reclining around it with their hands in the bowl. Some were chewing and yet did not chew. Some were picking up something to eat and yet did not pick it up. And some were putting food in their mouths and yet did not do so. Instead, they were all looking upward. I saw sheep being driven along and yet the sheep stood still. The shepherd was lifting his hand to strike them and, and yet his hand remained raised. And I observed the current of the river and I saw goats with their mouths in the water and yet they were not drinking. And all of a sudden everything and everybody went on with what they had been doing. Uh, this is a particularly powerful chapter, chapter 18. It's actually my favorite in the entire uh, the entire Protoevangelium of James. And, and basically what it does is it depicts all time standing still as the God of time enters into time. The vault of the heaven freezes, the birds in the air freeze in the sky, all humanity freezes in their actions, and the God of time who lives beyond time enters into our reality and it freezes things. In fact, we can see a parallel to this in the Gospels, <coughs> excuse me, in the Gospels, uh, where at the death of Jesus, the, the earth becomes dark, and it's as if it's neither day nor night, but something between, where creation itself recognizes that some profound moment has in fact occurred. In fact, I'm as I think about this chapter, I'm, I think of the quote of, Saint Leo the Great as he writes in his uh, great tome that is uh, a defense of Jesus' full humanity and full divinity at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 where he describes this incarnation event as wonderfully unique and uniquely wonderful and I just think that that's a beautiful way of depicting the once only uniqueness of the incarnation and that all time stops as the maker enters into our reality. Beautiful, love it. Chapter 18. We'll move on with our story. <clears throat> and I saw a woman coming down from the hill country and she asked, where are you going, sir? I replied, I'm looking for a Hebrew midwife. She inquired, are you an Israelite? And he, I told her, yes. And she said, who's the one having a baby in the cave? I replied, my fiance. And as she continued, she isn't your wife. I said to her, she is Mary, who was raised in the temple of the Lord. I obtained her by lot as my wife, but she's not really my wife. She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The midwife said, really? Joseph responded, come and see. And the midwife went with him and they stood at the front of the cave and a dark cloud overshadowed it. The midwife said, I've really been privileged because today my eyes have seen a miracle in that salvation has come to Israel. Suddenly the cloud withdrew from the cave and an intense light appeared inside the cave so that their eyes could not bear to look. And a little later, that light receded until an infant became visible. He took the breast of his mother Mary. Notice that there is, unlike the birth of uh, Mary to her, her mother Anna, there's no period of purification that's needed uh, for Mary as there was a period of purification for Anna. She gives the breast to Jesus immediately. Then the midwife shouted, what a great day this is for me because I've seen this new miracle. 
And the midwife left the cave and met Salome and said to her, Salome, Salome, let me tell you about a new marvel. A virgin has given birth, and you know that's impossible. And Salome replied, As the Lord my God lives, unless I insert my finger and examine her, I will never believe that a virgin has given birth. And here we have, this is the icon of the nativity, uh, the orthodox icon of the nativity. It comes in different variants. But I wanted to point out something to you. You can see there's many details, the angels, the magi. As we look at the top left, the angels appear in the middle on the, on the left, the magi uh, coming. Uh, we see uh, Joseph sitting at the lower left. And then if you swing to the lower right, you see Salome and the other midwife uh, holding the baby Jesus in her hands. Now I'd like to point out to you, <clears throat> in this particular icon, this particular variant, Often in the nativity icons, you'll see a scruffy looking old man who's dressed in rather shaggy looking clothes. Many times that old man is pictured in front of the sitting uh, Joseph. But in this particular case, he's depicted uh, talking to the midwife uh, Salome. Now why that's important is this old man is representative of the devil. He is depicted as trying to uh, discredit the virginity of Mary and we see him talking to the midwife's uh, Salome here. This will become very important as we go forward in the story. The midwife entered and said, Mary, position yourself for an examination. You are facing a serious test. And so Mary, when she heard these instructions, positioned herself and Salome inserted her finger into Mary. And then Salome cried out and said, I'll be damned because of my transgression and my disbelief. I have put the living God on trial. Look." My hand is disappearing. It's being consumed by flames. We're going to return to this in just a moment. <clears throat> then Salome fell on her knees and in the presence of the Lord with these words, God of my ancestors, remember me because I am a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not make an example of me for the people of Israel, but give me a place among the poor again. You yourself know, Lord, that I've been healing people in your name and I've been receiving my payment from you. Now, if we return to this icon here, we see Salome depicted in the lower left and she's holding the baby Jesus. Now, as we go forward in this nativity, these nativity icons, notice that in this particular variant, she extends her hand into the water, symbolizing the healing and the restoration of that burned hand. And suddenly a messenger of the Lord appeared saying to her, Salome, Salome, the Lord of all has heard your prayer. Hold out your hand to the child and pick him up and then you'll have salvation and joy. Salome approached the child and picked him up with these words. I'll worship him because he's been born to be the king of Israel. And Salome was instantly healed and left the cave vindicated. And a voice said abruptly, Salome, Salome, don't report the marvels you've seen until the child goes to Jerusalem. Joseph was about ready to depart for Judea, but a great uproar was about to take place in Bethlehem in Judea, and it all started when astrologers came inquiring, where is the newborn king of the Judeans? We're here because we saw his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When Herod heard about their visit, he was terrified and he sent agents to the astrologers. He also sent for the high priest and questioned them in his palace. What has been written about the anointed? Where is he supposed to be born? They said to him, in Bethlehem, Judea. That's what the scriptures say. And he dismissed them. Then he questioned the astrologers. What sign have you seen regarding the one who was born king? And the astrologer said, we saw a star of exceptional brilliance in the sky, and it so dimmed the other stars that they disappeared. Consequently, we know that a king was born for Israel, and we have come to pay him homage. Herod instructed them, go, begin your search, and if you find him, report back to me so that I also may go and pay him homage. The astrologers departed. And there it was, the star that they had seen in the east led them on until they came to the cave. Then the star stopped directly above the head of the child. After the astrologers saw him with his mother Mary, they took out of their pouches gold, pure incense, and myrrh. 
since they had been advised by a heavenly messenger not to go into Judea, they returned to their country by another route. I think this one is particularly beautiful. I love the way that this art is done, that you get this sense of the mountains, the crevices of the mountains, and the cave that Mary and, and the, her son Jesus, uh, where they meet the, the Magi. <coughs> when Herod realized that he'd been duped by the astrologers, he flew into a rage and dispatched his executioners with instructions to kill all the infants, two years old and younger. When Mary heard that the infants were being killed, she was frightened and took her child, wrapped him in strips of cloth, and put him in a feeding trough used by cattle. As for Elizabeth, when she heard that they were looking for John, she took him and went up into the hill country. She kept searching for a place to hide him, but there was none to be had. Then she groaned and said out loud, Mountain of God, please take in a mother with her child. You see, Elizabeth was unable to keep on climbing because her nerve had failed her. But suddenly the mountain was split open and let them in. This mountain allowed the light to shine through to her since a messenger of the Lord was with them for protection. And I love this particular icon where you see Elizabeth and her child are hidden in the cave and protected from the soldier who would do them harm, who's looking for them. Now Herod kept looking for John and sent his agents to Zechariah, serving at the altar with his message for them. Where have you hidden your son? But he answered them, I'm the minister of God attending at, to his temple. How should I know where my son is? Now, just as a footnote here, why does Herod target John? Well, the high priest, his father, Zechariah, is the highest, the next highest political authority. We always think of religious authorities. The high priest is a religious authority. But in, in Israel, the high priest, religion and politics are not separated. Remember, a king of the people is chosen by God. David is chosen by God because of his relationship with God and anointed and subsequently made king. So religion and politics are not separated. So obviously Herod thinks that his single greatest threat is in fact the high priest. And so he assumes that if there is a newborn king that is going to usurp his throne, it's got to be the son of Zechariah, John. So he targets him. So the agents left and reported all this to Herod, who became angry and said, is his son going to rule over Israel? And he sent his agents back with his message for him. Tell me the truth. Where is your son? Don't you know that I have your life in my power? And the agents went and reported this message to him. And Zechariah answered, I am a martyr for God. Take my life. The Lord, though, will receive my spirit because you are shedding innocent blood at the entrance to the temple of the Lord. And so at daybreak, Zechariah was murdered. But the people of Israel did not know that he had been murdered. At the hour of formal greetings, the priest departed. But Zechariah did not meet and bless them as was his customary. And so the priest waited around for Zechariah to greet him with prayer and to praise the Most High God. But when he did not show up, they became fearful. Now one of them, however, summoned up his courage, entered the sanctuary, and saw dried blood next to the Lord's altar. And a voice said, Zechariah has been murdered. His blood will not be cleaned up until his avenger appears. When he heard this utterance, he was afraid and went out and reported to the priests what he had seen and heard. And they summoned up their courage, entered and saw what had happened. The panels of the temple cried out and the priests ripped their robes from top to bottom. They didn't find a corpse, but they did find his blood now turned to stone. They were afraid and they went out and reported to the people that Zechariah had been murdered. When all the tribes of the people heard this, they began to mourn, and they beat their breasts for three days and three nights. After three days, however, the priests deliberated about whom they should appoint to the position of Zechariah. The lot fell to Simeon, 
This man, you see, is the one who was informed by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he laid eyes on the anointed in the flesh. Now I, James, am the one who wrote this account at the time when an uproar arose in Jerusalem at the death of Herod. I took myself off to the wilderness until the uproar in Jerusalem died down. There I praise the Lord God who gave me the wisdom to write this account. Grace be with you all, those who fear the Lord. Amen. Now, this James that's depicted here in this icon, which by the way, gorgeous icon, I'd love to get my hands on this one. Um, this is James known as the brother of the Lord. Uh, this is the James that's listed in chapter six of the Gospel of Mark as one of the brothers. Uh, now, how that's understood is depending on who you talk to. There are basically three different uh, interpretations of how you can understand the brothers of the Lord. And I'll recite them. The first one is a Protestant understanding that Mary was a virgin at the time of her conception of Jesus, but after that had children in the normal fashion with Joseph and had other children, uh, girls and boys that are listed uh, in the Gospel of Mark chapter six. That's the Protestant interpretation of this. The, uh, the Roman Catholic, typical Roman Catholic understanding of this was kind of promulgated by Jerome. And Jerome understood these, the, the idea of the brothers of the Lord as being uh, cousins, uh, relatives of the Lord, like the extended family, so to speak. And then of course, the third understanding is an understanding that's informed here by the Protoevangelium of James, that Joseph had had children by a previous marriage, that he was a widower, and that uh, these brothers of the Lord would be the equivalent of stepbrothers of Jesus. And that is typically the view that is uh, adopted by the Eastern uh, Orthodox uh, churches. Um, my understanding from my discussions with several bishops is that this, is, this understanding is also acceptable uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, that the church hasn't specifically um, made a decision about how that should be best understood with regard to the brothers. Now, be that as it may, this James is the one that's one of the ones that's referred to specifically as the brother of the Lord. And we, we see him appear particularly in the letter of Paul to the Galatians, uh, particularly chapters one and two. And then again, he serves as kind of the moderator of the so-called Council of Jerusalem uh, that is depicted in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. This would also be that James, uh, that the book of James in the New Testament uh, is attributed to as well. And he is known, according to the terminology that is given him by Paul, as one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem, along with Peter and John. So he has no small potatoes, so to speak, uh, within the early church. And tradition has him martyred around the year 62 uh, in Jerusalem, that he is killed for his uh, confession of Jesus Christ as Messiah there in Jerusalem. Uh, the tradition actually has an interesting aspect of James uh, that's noted about him is that his, uh, they say that his knees were as knobby as the knees of a camel. And the reason for that was that he spent day and night praying for the people of Israel. Uh, it's kind of a beautiful image that his knees would have become hardened from all this time that he spent on them as intercessor for the people. So that's a beautiful, a beautiful consideration. So moving forward, let's, uh, let's, conclude our presentation with a few re, uh, remaining remarks, uh, talk about some of the art, where we got it, uh, and where one might find it for a closer look. Um, there, there is a tendency within Christianity, both East and West, to have what we call cycles of the life of Mary, where you find a number of paintings or frescoes or um, mosaics that depict different scenes from the life of Mary. And it's in these collections or these lives of Mary that we find um, many of the art that we have used in this presentation and much that didn't appear in this presentation. Now, I'd like to point you to several of these sources that you can look up online and see these paintings for yourself. Of course, you can go back in the presentation and look at them as well. The first is this uh, by the famous Giotto di Bandone uh, that was done around the year 1305, and they're found in what's called the Scrovene uh, Chapel, also known as known as the Arena Chapel in Padua, Italy. And a number of these particular paintings of Giotto have been used in this presentation. And here's another one. This is one of the Nativity itself. But I wanted to just give you an example. This is what uh, you're looking for as you go back in the presentation to see this cycle. 
A second source that's very intriguing is uh, the Church of the Holy Savior in Kora in Istanbul. Now keep in mind that originally Turkey was a great center of early Christianity and of course eventually became uh, Islamic. So many of these buildings that were once churches became uh, mosques. This is uh, one of the most famous examples of this is Hagia Sophia, the great, uh, the great um, uh, church that is found in Istanbul. Uh, now this in particular case, the Kora Church, was originally built in the early 5th century, but most of the current structure dates from around the 11th century, the latter part of the 11th century. And its frescoes and mosaics were added in the 14th century, in the early part of the 14th century. Now in the early 16th century, the church was converted into a mosque by its new rulers, the Ottoman rulers, and the frescoes and mosaics were plastered over at that time. However, in 1948, it was secularized and became a museum, and in the following years, those mosaics and frescoes were uh, restored and now are available, and many of those have appeared in this presentation. And this is an example of one here. This one is an interesting one. It uh, depicts Mary and Joseph coming to uh, enroll for the taxation that uh, was the reason why they went to Bethlehem in the first place. And this one dates from roughly around the year 1350. Another source is uh, Tornabioni Chapel, uh, which is in the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, Italy. Go figure that Florence would supply us with great art. Uh, it is famous for its numerous and well-preserved frescoes, which were created by Domenico Ghirlandaio uh, and his workshop between the years 1485 and 1490. And we did use some of his work and it has a very distinctive character to it. And here is the work called The Visitation that he produced. Then the Cremona Cathedral is dedicated to the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's located in Cremona, Italy, and it boasts a series of frescoes. Now, I love this guy's name. How could you not like this guy's name? Boccaccio Boccaccino. I mean, this guy, I don't care if he colored in crayon. He's in this presentation just for the name alone. Um, he does a series of scenes that illustrate the life of Mary. And let's take a look at some examples. We, we did see some of these, particularly uh, the birth of Mary uh, back in the uh, presentation itself. But this one is the betrothal of Mary, uh, dates from roughly 1514 to 1515, and of course found in the Cremona Cathedral. Finally, even in the Pope's church in St. Peter's Basilica, it contains the Capella della Present Present uh, Present uh, ah, I can't. I'm tripping all over myself. The Presentation Chapel, the mosaic altarpiece, is the Presentation of the Virgin Mary in the Temple by her parents Anna and Joachim, and the altar is dedicated, of course, to Saint Pius X. And we see a, a beautiful picture of it here, and you can see the size and scale of this particular piece of art. And then these are some uh, selected pieces of bibliography I'd like to um, re make reference to. I'd like to draw your attention in particular <coughs> to the work by Ronald F. Hawk. Uh, it's his translation that we used in this presentation. I recommend it highly. In particular, for most regular people who are not concerned about scholarship, um, the work, The Life of Mary and Birth of Jesus, the Ancient Infancy Gospel of James is very nice because it includes a lot of art both in black and white prints and also in color of various mosaics, frescoes, and icons. And so it, it adds that artistic element uh, that I think is very useful. All right, as a kind of a bit of a final note here, um, I would like to uh, comment uh, you know, on, on the Protoevangelum of James. It's interesting as you do the research that early on in the Roman uh, Catholic Church, in the Western Church, there was some concern and um, uh, criticism of the Protoevangelum of James. Uh, it was ruled, of course, out of the canon. I mean, we've said that early on in the presentation, and we see a number of references where it's actually condemned uh, and, and relegated to the apocryphal literature as not, you know, that we necessarily include as part of our doctrinal, um, uh, our doctrinal basis as Catholics. In particular, I mean, I can sort, cite different sources, but I'd like to focus Pope Innocent I, who was the Bishop of Rome from the years 401 to 417, wrote in his letter to Ex, uh, Exerpius 
of to Toulouse uh, that was dated roughly around the year 405. He says this, Pope Innocent I says, A short annotation shows what books are to be accepted as canonical. As you wished to be informed specifically, they are as follows. The five books of Moses, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Jesus' nave, one of Judges, four of Kingdoms, and also Ruth, 16 books of the prophets, five books of Solomon, the Psalter, likewise of the histories, one book of Job, one book of Tobias, one of Esther, one of Judith, two of Maccabees, two of Ezra, two books of the uh, Paralipomenon, uh, likewise of the New Testament, four books of the Gospels, 14 epistles of Paul, three epistles of John, two epistles of Peter, the epistle of Jude, the epistle of James, the Acts of the Apostles, the Apocalypse of John, others, however, which were written under the name of Matthias or James the Less, or under the name of Peter or John or by certain Lucius, or under the name of Andrew by the philosophers Nexocharis or Leonidas, or under the name of Thomas, uh, and such others as may be are not only to be repudiated, but you, but you, as you know, are also to be condemned. And so, Pope Leo the, or excuse me, Pope Innocent the First condemns the Protoevangelium of James and declares it to not be canonical. Now, what's interesting? I've already demonstrated to you that the art uh, that depicts the stories that are found in the Protoevangelium of James pepper the churches both east, east and west, and thoroughly throughout Italy, including the Basilica of St. Peter, which, by the way, if you know anything about apocryphal literature, the, epistle, the um, Basilica of St. Peter is literally dripping in apocryphal art. It's amazing. I mean, if you love apocryphal literature, New Testament apocryphal literature like I do, there's probably no better place, no single better place you could go than the uh, Basilica of St. Peter in Rome uh, to see renditions of art depicting these various stories. Um, now, with all this said, here you have this condemnation, the relegation of this text as non-canonical. We accept that. What's interesting is that the church seems to be of more than one mind in this regard because we take note that in the church's liturgical year, um, we see that no less than three feast days that have no explanation except in relationship to the stories that are originally found in the Protoevangelium of James. And let's outline these feasts. The first one is uh, appears on July 26th, the feast of Saints Joachim and Anna, parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Protoevangelium of James is where we first encounter a tradition that actually names Mary's parents. The second feast in question is found on September the 8th, and it's the Nativity of the Virgin Mary. Again, the very first account that we have of the birth of Mary appears in the Protoevangelium of James, chapter 5. And then, third, November 21st, as we already mentioned earlier in this presentation, the Feast of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that story appears uh, in the Protoevangelium of James, chapter 7. So here you have three feast days that specifically make reference to stories that we find in no other place than the Protoevangelium of James. So I conclude with this kind of thought that uh, for all the church's concern about some of the elements of this story, the church can't help herself. Uh, like me, the church, in fact, loves this story. Uh, it's a beautiful story of Mary, and I offer it uh, to you uh, for your reflection and Marian devotion. And I thank you very much for your time and consideration of this presentation. God bless.